Well, it's so good to be together today. Welcome, everybody, all of our campuses today in Sunnyville, Fremont, San Jose, Church Online. We've been in a journey called Wonderfully Made, and today we wrap it up. It's been five weeks, and if you've missed any of the previous weeks, I want to encourage you to catch up, to go back and watch it. We've addressed issues of sexuality, gender, uh, body, all kinds of fun stuff together. It's been so good for our community, and I'm so glad you joined us today for week number five. Every week so far, we've addressed or we've synced up on some ground rules together in order to keep us unified uh, as a diverse community. So I want to remind you of those as we get started today as well. The number one thing we said is we don't have to agree in order to show respect and love. So I'm reminding you of that today. You are welcome here. This is not a place where we uh, show hatred and disunity in that way. We're here to show respect and love. Number two, we're a community centered on Jesus and his teaching. So what we're doing is we're giving our very best understanding of what the Bible has to say. We're not here to debate or argue, but to learn to love and to live more like Jesus. And then number three, throughout this whole series, we've had a consistent message that we're here to create bridges. Bridges, not to build walls. No matter who you are, what you've done, what you consider, consider yourself to be, in any of the topics we're talking about, you are loved here. We're all broken, but we all need grace. You are accepted and loved in this place, and we're so glad that you're journeying with us in this process of becoming more like Jesus. In fact, I love for us to start by praying together, and we're going to pray also for the other churches that are in this series with us as we all wrap up together our time in this teaching. So Father, thank you for this. Thank you that we've gotten to learn, to grow together. Thank you that you're a God that loves us, that calls us to a flourishing life. Father, we pray today that you would bless Menlo Church and Westgate Church and Vintage Faith in Santa Cruz and Echo in all of our campuses. Everybody listening today and watching, would you meet us here and speak to us in Jesus' name, amen. You know, one of the things that's made this topic so difficult is the fact that we have in so many ways as a Christian church misrepresented Jesus to people. And I've talked about this before in the beginning of the series, but there has been many occasions where those that call themselves Christians by the name of Jesus have, have misrepresented Jesus to culture. And because of that, there's been wounds and hurts that especially those in the LGBTQ plus community have uh, experienced because of the church or those that call themselves Christians. And this has made this topic increasingly difficult to talk about because of that pain and because of some of those things that came from a misrepresentation of Jesus. So I want to address an important question today together, which is how do you respond to a world that maybe believes different, but you want to do it in such a way that's loving and kind as well. Like, how do you hold the tension of sometimes feeling like what you believe and what's experienced in society or even inside your body don't quite match? What is the way of Jesus in relation to this? See, there's these two tensions I constantly feel in life and even throughout this series. One tension is this. I believe that God calls me to unconditionally love all people. It doesn't matter who they are, what they've done to me or to others. I'm called to forgive, to show compassion, to love. It includes good people, evil people, people like me, people not like me, even Lakers fans. I'm called to love and Raiders fans, and it's hard for me. But I'm called to love all people. But at the same time, I also believe that I'm called to an uncompromising faith in the Word of God, that I'm not supposed to change my belief and convictions of the Word of God based on the newest trend being taught in culture today. And sometimes those two things are really difficult to hold together. I'm guessing that many of you relate with me, that maybe even for you, the tension is not just outward, it's inward. Like you, you feel like you're, you have desires that contradict what you believe the truth of God word, God's word teaches. And so you've had to navigate, I, I want to do something, but I believe the word tells me to do something else. What do I do? Do I follow truth or do I follow feeling? 
Others, you, you experience this a little different. Maybe you're like, I, I thought I knew what I believed about se- sexuality and gender until your, your child came in and said, hey, dad, mom, I'm, I'm gay, or I feel like I'm living in the wrong body, and all of a sudden you're like, I, how do I respond? Do I, do I let go of some things I believe to embrace? What, what, do, what do I do? How do we navigate that tension? Well, the Bible has a lot to say about this. In fact, I want to tell you, show you a teaching today, some principles that I believe can be some of the most life-transforming principles in these conversations of great tension. And to help us understand, we're going to take a journey back in time to the 14th century B.C. That's where we're starting today. And we're going to look at the life of Moses for just a few minutes together. And if you're, you know, you don't have to be a Christian to know who Moses is. Moses was that guy that lived in the 14th century B.C. and He took the Israelites out of Egyptian slavery and brought them to the land that's now Israel. And he's also the guy that had the Ten Commandments delivered to him. And the Ten Commandments that he brought down from a mountain in an encounter with God became the moral authority, the standard of morality for almost every culture on earth ever since that century that he lived. Now, in this journey of delivering the Israelites from Egyptian slavery, in that journey, Moses had this incredibly bold request of God. Perhaps the boldest thing that any human had ever asked God up to this point. He's in the journey. He says, God, show me your glorious presence. It's like, God, I I don't want to just kind of hear about you. I want to know, like, what's the radiance, the glory of your presence. I want to see it. I want to see how big you really are, God. Would you show it to me? And God turned to him and said, hey, Moses, if you can't see me face to face and survive, but here's what I'll do for you. I'm going to walk past you, and when I walk past you, I'm going to call out my name to you. The name, your name reveals your identity. So here's what God did. It says that the Lord passed in front of Moses, calling out Yahweh first. Yahweh is the name of God in the Hebrew language. And it literally means I am who I am. I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. I will always be. That's who I am. So God revealed himself to Moses by saying, I am. And then he says, the God of compassion and of mercy. I am slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. So God here in perhaps the greatest revelation that a human had ever experienced of God revealed himself with two concepts. He says, Moses, if you want to know what my glory is about, what it's like, the summary of my attributes, my characteristics, he remember this. I am who I say I am and I am filled with two things, unfailing love. Kindness, grace, and faithfulness, truth. And this is what we actually would expect of any loving person, any loving God especially. He is one that's filled with both both of these realities. In fact, let me unpack what these words mean to you for just a minute. Unfailing love is the word chesed in Hebrew, and it's often translated as grace or mercy or loving kindness and goodness. So this uh, unfailing love of God is is a word that's hard to comprehend, but it it communicates the grace that flows from the loving part of who he is. The word faithfulness is the word emeth, and it's often translated as truth, firmness, and faithfulness. So this is God saying, I'm the God who forgives you, who loves you, who accepts you. My forgiveness goes from generation to generation, but I am also just and firm and faithful. I am who I am. I am unchanging. I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. I am tough and I am tender. I am loving and I am just and confident and firm. This is how God summarized his character to Moses. This is actually very powerful when you experience it, experience it firsthand as well. I, I, you know, some of the people that most modeled this for me has actually been my parents. The year that my life was most transformed in terms of going from darkness to light and having a revelation of God was my junior year of high school. 
And in that year, my dad got a call from my school, and the principal said, I'm here with a bunch of police officers. We caught your son with drug paraphernalia. He's been selling drugs at our school. Come pick him up. So you can imagine most dads are like, ooh, let me take out my belt, <laughs> you know, let me figure out what to do. So my dad came out, and I experienced something that was so radical and so different for me, and it was life-changing. See, if, if a parent is just loving, what they would do is they would say, oh, son, uh, it's okay. Everybody smokes weed. Everybody does this stuff. I mean, it's, it's just your reality. It's okay. We love you no matter what, and that's it. And then some parents, when they embrace just truth, they're like, whoa, how dare you do that? You know, like you're punished forever. Never leave your room again. And I mean, they're, they're just like a, it's firm and tough and all this stuff. But what happens when you have both? See, my parents met me with both. And it was powerful for me. They didn't just say, it's okay, do whatever you want. They held me accountable. They told me, I'm, not, I'm like, that, mom, dad, don't you love me? Just let me be. We love you. And we'll care for you, but you can't leave this house to go have fun with your friends for a few weeks. There's accountability for your actions. And in that firmness and loving kindness, my eyes were open to God. And that year, my life was changed. And I don't think it's a coincidence. There are dozens and dozens of verses all throughout the scripture that speak of the power of faithfulness or truth combining with grace or love. And in fact, this became the most celebrated attribute or characteristic, of, character, characteristic of, God, of God in all of the scriptures. So you see, for example, the psalmist would say things like this. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne, God. Unfailing love and truth, they walk before you as your attendants. There are other psalms that would say, God, I will sing of your unfailing love in the morning and of your faithfulness in the evening. It also was what was described prophetically of the one who would come representing God to humanity as what's called the Messiah, the sent one of God that would solve the problem of sin. All these prophets would speak of one day God sending somebody, and when he would send that one, here's how it would describe that one. Isaiah, the prophet, said, one of David's descendants will be king, and he will rule people with faithfulness and love. Here's how you recognize God sending the one that will solve the problem of sin. He's going to come with faithfulness or truth and with love and grace. So it's not an accident that when Jesus came into the world, that his biographers, one of whom called John, wrote this about him. It says, so the word became human. Now, this concept of word was what the ancients described the embodiment of God's communication to humanity. So God's communication took the form of flesh. He spoke to us through flesh, and he made his home among us. And then it says he was full of unfailing love, that's grace, and faithfulness, that's truth. This is very powerful. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. Remember the the question that Moses asked, God, I want to see your glory? Now it's echoing thousands of years later in this person of Jesus. He says, you want to see God's glory? It's not what was revealed to Moses back then. God's glory is now revealed to humanity. You want to see him? Here he is. He's in Jesus. And he came full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And the same revelation that Moses had on that mountain with God. And then it says, from his abundance, we have all received one gracious blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses. That's the Ten Commandments and the religious law. But God's, listen, unfailing love, that's his grace, and his faithfulness, that's truth, was revealed to us through Jesus. No one has ever seen God, he says. Remember, God said, Moses, you can't see me face to face. It's it's the same echo of the same story. No one's ever seen God but the unique one who is God himself. This is speaking of Jesus, and he is near to the Father's heart, and he has revealed God to us. 
So God's like, you want to know what my character is like? You just look at Jesus. Jesus then modeled this life of unfailing love and faithfulness unlike anyone has ever done and therefore changed all of humanity. I want to illustrate this to you by bringing two people to the stage. Would you help me welcome Derek and Kaylin to the stage? Come on over, guys. So Derek here is going to represent truth today because he is uh, he's truth. He is firm. He is solid. He's faithful, right? Yes. And then Kaylin here is my daughter, and her middle name is actually Grace, and she's actually the sweetest girl I know and you should clap for that, by the way, church. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So here's what typically happens. Holding the tension in the middle is really difficult. When people say, hey, I'm, I'm going to hold on, I'm going to be uncompromising with my faith, and I'm going to be unconditional with my love, it is the toughest of all decisions. So what most people do is they'll let go of one, let go of grace, and they'll say, you know what? I'm just going to be about truth. Here's what God says to you. And these are people that sometimes protest. They have a self-righteous approach to life. Maybe you've been there or you are there still today. You know what you believe, but nobody cares because you have no love and compassion. You haven't taken the time to hear someone's story, to look them in the eye, to understand their pain. But you know what you believe, and you're like, I got the truth of God in me. But let me just remind you, this is not God. This truth without grace is a partial revelation of God, and it leads to wounds. These are the people that hold up signs, and they say, look at what the Bible says. Look at what God has to say. F you, world. It's not God. But if you let go of truth, I won't hurt you too much. There you go. And you hold on to just grace, it's actually just as bad. Because, you see, the truth will set you free. And grace says, nah, you don't need to change anything. You are what your feelings say you are. Everything is relative. There is no moral standard or absolute truth. Forget that. It's too hard to hold on to both. So just, just be you. Follow your truth. Follow your emotion. You make up your own standard. You don't have to change and this is really easy to do, but it leads to a lack of accountability and no transformation. And without truth, there is no power. And without grace, there is no power. But right in the middle is a place that when we hold on tight, there's tremendous revelation of God. There's transformation of lives. Here's the principle. True transformation happens when unconditional love and uncompromising faith are held in tension. And it's really difficult to do. It is actually the hardest of all decisions. That's why so many people just let go of one or the other. Because holding the tension makes you have to discern things, makes you have to pray, makes you have to get to know the person and get to know God's word. So what if I just let go of one to go to the next? But what Jesus did is he modeled both of these together. So he had moments where people try to say, let's see if, we, if he's going to let go of truth. Jesus, here's an adulterous woman. The truth says, tradition and whatever else says, we got to stone this woman. What are you going to do? And they thought, they thought that we got him. So he looks at her. He says, I love you. I forgive you. Go and sin no more. Never let go of truth or grace. There were moments where people knew for sure he was going to let go of grace. He's going to let it all go, and he held them really tight, held people accountable, but loved them to death. He got to know their stories, but called them to a higher standard. He was able to hold the, and model the way for us to the point where people that were nothing like Jesus loved being with Jesus. You know why? Because he didn't just say, oh, be who you want to be and it's okay, not caring about their transformation and ignoring the truth that will set them free. 
And he didn't also say, you know what, here's what God says about you. Without first loving and accepting and showing mercy and kindness. In the tension of these two is the power of God. And a believer or a church that lets go of grace for the sake of truth loses the power of God. And if we let go of truth for the sake of loving all people because we don't know how to hold tensions, we also lose the power of God. But in the middle is a beautiful transformation of lives. Can we thank these two together? Appreciate you. I know that as I'm sharing this, you probably have some tension inside of you. And part of what I want you to remember is that the best thing to do is to hold the tension. I wonder if you can say that phrase with me, hold the tension. Can you do it? One, two, three. Hold the tension. Don't let go of the tension. It is so tempting to just let go because it's going to be so much easier to say, do whatever you want and it's okay. Or let me just tell you what I believe without caring about you, and it's okay. But when you hold the tension, something beautiful begins to happen. True transformation happens when we live with unconditional love and an uncompromising faith. It happens when grace and truth are held together. And people that were distant from Jesus, that didn't care about him, this is why they wanted to be with him. Because he called them to a standard that was so different than the rest. See, throughout this series, we've unpacked so many truths. We, we talked about how God cares about our body. And that what happens in our body now, the way we treat our body now, will echo into eternity. That our bodies matter to God and so we should see them with value. We also talked about how God designed marriage to be a covenantal relationship between a man and a woman. And when we display that properly, it beautifully displays God's longing to be intimate with humanity. It is a window into a beautiful reality. In the series, we talked about how sexual intimacy is supposed to be guarded in this relationship of man and woman in a covenantal marriage. It is where it's supposed to be reserved for that and how it displays something beautiful to the world. We spoke of the reward. For those that nail their passions and desires to the cross of Jesus, saying just because I have a desire doesn't mean it will lead me to a flourishing life. So we called you to surrender every desire and attraction and longing to something incredibly greater, which is the will of God, believing that the truth will set us free. We also talked about how the Christian church has historically always aligned sex and gender together, believing that God's design for male and female to reveal to the world a creative balance of God and humanity. It reveals something so much bigger than just what we think or see in the physical realm. All of these things we believe and affirm as a church. But listen to me carefully. Our truth and this truth is only as powerful as the grace by which we communicate it. If we say we have truth, but we don't know how to hold it with love, nobody will listen. And if we let go of truth for the sake of grace, nobody will be changed. It's the hardest of all paths. Now, churches and Christians that have hammered truth without properly loving unconditionally like Jesus, have done so much harm in this conversation, which is why so many people can care less about what the church has to say anymore. It's sinful for Christians to push what they believe to be true to an unbelieving world without showing love or listening first or stepping into someone's story first. You know, there's a beautiful quote by Preston Sprinkle, who is going to be with us this week. He wrote a book just on the topic of how to love and understand, uh, you know, homosexuality. And in that book, he said this in relation to this topic. He says, Jesus does not have a prejudice against any human being. But if he did, it would be against judgmental, homophobic, religious people. We need to destroy homophobia. 
If the church is ever going to solve this issue, it needs to stop seeing it as an issue. Homosexuality is not an issue to be solved. It's about people that need to be loved and to love. This is true. In the same way, though, churches and Christians that have turned to a grace-only theology have also done a tremendous disservice and injustice to the world. See, God loves us way too much to keep us as we are when we meet him. When we come to him, his grace receives us, but then he invites us to transformation. He holds us accountable to becoming better people, to loving better, to being transformed by the power of his Holy Spirit. And when we say, oh, great, there's so much grace, you don't need to change. We've done an incredible injustice to the world. Accepting everything is not real love. There is a better way. In fact, there is a way, you might want to write this one down, to lovingly accept people but not affirm all human choices as truth. See, truth is always narrow and grace is always wide. This is true in every way. For example, math- mathematically speaking, two plus two is always going to be four. Derek that was with me is taller than me. Ka- you know, Kaylin is sweeter than me. Like, this is true. It doesn't, it's not, you know, there, it's not relative. There, it's pink or it's blue. It's not both, right? There's all kinds of different, that, like, this is true. Truth is always narrow, but for some reason, when it comes to faith or religion or these topics, we start to say, no, 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 but in this case, truth is broad. You have your truth and you have your truth and every truth leads to God. But it cannot be true. Not all those things can equally be true. So when Jesus says, I am the truth, the way, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father but through me, he is just explaining the fact that truth is narrow. There is a narrow way to God. So because he is true, he is narrow in his way. But because he is gracious, the invitation is very wide. There is the widest possible invitation to the narrow way of truth. And when the church embraces both of these realities of being wide with our love and being narrow with our truth, this is when lives are most changed. David Bennett was with us a few weeks ago, and he was the gay activist who had vowed to destroy Christianity when he was an atheist. And had an encounter with the love of God that so changed him. And he, he wrote a book to talk about this part of our experience. And he says, it's called A War of Loves. And in it he said, unless we learn how to accept others without affirming everyone, we have lost the art of conversation because we're p- suppressing our honest opinions. We can accept and affirm people without uh, agreeing with and affirming all their desires or beliefs or accepting their actions. And perhaps one of the most powerful truths that Jesus taught us in this area of grace and truth is that grace and truth are best displayed through proximity, not from a distance. See, God, when he saw humanity suffering in sin, he didn't just like yell from the heavens, here's the solution, go figure it out over there. You know what he did? In his love, he stepped out of his glory, put on flesh and blood, came into our world, touched our skin, felt our pain, listened to our struggle. He became that struggle for us, and in proximity, he lovingly gave his life so that we would find restoration and forgiveness in God. This is the model of grace and truth. We're learning to become people like this. In fact, this week, there's a powerful event. I don't want you to miss out. I'm going to put it on the screen. Preston Sprinkle, who is like one of the greatest authorities in this area of sexuality and gender. He's been, you know, traveling all over the world. He's a scholar, theologian, and has written great books. He's going to be with us. And on Tuesday night, I want to ask you to be a part of both of these experiences. It's a long drive. Menlo Church is going to host it for all of our churches together, an event that's for everyone. And we're going to talk about the theology of marriage, same-sex relationships, all the topics listed there. And on Wednesday night, all of our students are going to come 
combined with the students of Menlo Church and Westgate and Vintage in a really cool experience where all, there's going to be hundreds and hundreds of students together learning how to love people that are different than them and are like them, how to navigate their own experiences themselves or with friends that are in the LGBTQ plus community. Very important conversations. I know for some of you it's hard to get there. I want to ask you to prioritize it. Try your best to be there. Register ahead of time. Imagine with me what would happen if we became this kind of community that embraced the character of God with unfailing love and an uncompromising faith. Imagine a community of people that, love, that know how to hold the tension of these two realities. I think in that kind of community, there would be all kinds of people being transformed. It would be filled with gay people and straight people and transgender people and cisgender people and cheaters and adulterers and murderers and everything else. But everyone would be finding hope and transformation in that kind of community. When Jesus shows up and reveals his glory, he changes us from the inside out. You know, in the last few months when I met with people in the LGBTQ plus community and listened to them and cried with them and asked for their stories, I would ask them at the end of our time together, many of them, if there is something that you want to make sure our church hears in this series, what would that be? And I want to read to you some of the things they told me as we finish this series together. One of them said this to me. Can you tell them that when they meet one person in the LGBTQ plus community, they've only met one person. Our stories are all different. Please get to know us. Another young girl who is struggling with gender dysphoria, she said this, um, I just wish people would listen to me. I wish they would get to know me instead of judging me or joking about me from a distance. There was a couple of them that said this to me. Tell them they don't have to hide what they believe. Said, I, I don't want to be in a church that tells me only what I want to hear. Don't water down the truth in trying to love me. Help me understand it, but walk with me, hear me, and challenge me to be more like Jesus. And then another one said this, thank you for creating an environment of love without pressuring me to change behaviors before God has a chance to change my heart. See, a radically biblical community it knows how to pursue truth with humility, but it always lavishes grace on all who fails. In this kind of community, judgment is replaced by compassion. Acceptance is partnered with accountability. Confession of sin is a regular practice because in this kind of community, we know we're all broken. Nobody's better than the other. We all need grace, and we all need acceptance in the church. This is why we need to continually create environments that have love and truth colliding in those environments, held together in tension. This is why we need more young people who know how to courageously speak truth in their schools, but do it with understanding and care and compassion to those that are different from them. This is why we need businessmen and women who don't just change their belief with every new staff training or cultural trend, but that know how to navigate the complexities of conversations around gender and sexuality with incredible understanding and love and compassion. We need parents who intentionally teach their kids how to see their beautiful bodies in light of God's design. We need parents that know how to show them you're wonderfully made. Like God cares deeply about who you are. You don't have to just believe everything your school's teaching you even. 
you don't have to follow just your emotions. You are who God says you are. You're not who culture tells you you are. But we also need parents that teach their kids how to love those that don't believe what we believe. We need young people, young adults, who are committed to sexual purity, who don't just change what they know the Bible says about preserving their sexuality and their expression of sexuality to the covenantal relationship of marriage, who stop ignoring the Word of God because they just want to follow what their longings and desires want. We need people that hold the tension and say, God, I will be uncompromising with my faith, and I will be unconditional with my love. That's how a workplace is changed. That's how a school is changed. And when I think about our region and our mission to transform this region, it requires us to be a community of people that know how to hold the tension, to say, God, we will reveal your glory to our region, not just by hammering truth or not just by accepting everything in the name of grace, but by holding the greatest of all tensions that Jesus modeled for us, that we will be people of the word people faithful to the one true God, people that believe there is a narrow way, but there is a wide invitation of grace. I wonder what God is saying to you about your response. Because some of you, you've let go of grace, and God is saying to you, take a grip, a tougher grip on grace. You've been judgmental, You've held on to truth, but nobody's listening to you. Get to know somebody, hear their story, get in their shoes. Others here, you've let go of, of all of grace, and you, you need to hold on to truth. You've changed your belief because somebody near you or in you or in your family has come to you and challenged you. And now you, don't, you didn't know how to hold them, so you let go of truth. And God's saying, do not let go. A powerful church is a church that holds the tension. And if that's you today, I want to ask you to repent. Say, God, I need to be more gracious or I need to be more truthful. Help me to be more like Jesus. And we're going to wrap up these five weeks by celebrating lives that God has changed and they're going to get baptized today right after this experience. And in just a minute, we're going to sing a song together. Some people already came ready to get baptized. But I felt like I needed to make a call because there's some here that you've never been baptized. And today or throughout the series, God's called you to a transformation of life. And Jesus is calling you. He's saying, come to me. Trust that I died on that cross for you. And when you come with the truth of your sin, I extend the grace and the forgiveness of my presence. And when you go under that water, all those people you're about to witness, that old, that's symbolic of their old life being gone as they come out of the water. It's a new life in Christ. And some of you, you should not wait till tomorrow to do that which God is calling you to do today. So right around our campuses, as you look around, there's blue wands waving there in Sunnyvale, Fremont, San Jose. Those are our baptism volunteers. And if you know that today is the day you're supposed to get baptized and you didn't come ready, they're going to give you a change of clothes. They're going to give you flip-flops, uh, underwear, whatever. Whatever you need, there's hair dryers in the bathroom. There's no excuse today. I want to encourage you to take a bold step and let's celebrate the fact that God is good. And in his goodness, he meets us right there in the truth of our sin. And then in his goodness, he says, I'm going to give you a new beginning. Would you stand with me, church, as we pray? Father, right now, you see our hearts. You see, God, all that's within us and our desire is to please you. I want to ask you to make us a church that embraces truth and grace. God, that as you look at our region and you, you desire to change this region, would you see us as people that will become more and more like Jesus, who welcomes all, who loves all, who forgives all, but that is also uncompromising with our belief and our faith in your words. And as people step out even in bold proclamation of their faith in baptism, would you bless them? Make this a day they'll never forget. And we will give you all the glory 
and all the honor and all the praise. And if you believe that with me, let's clap together and thank our God as we sing.